Hi, this is Brooke, the founder of the Santa Barbara Blockchain Institute with a mission to provide Bitcoin lessons for everyone. And to that end, I've created a series of 10 separate lectures that we're posting onto YouTube. We've made it most of the way through all of those if you've been watching along with me. And we finally come to the last lecture, which is number 10, and its subject is adoption. We'll talk about worldwide adoption and look at some interesting charts about how we can kind of measure that and what they may mean. Because as a first uh, real digital asset uh, without uh, uh, existence in the real world, uh, we can use some other tools uh, and measure its growth and adoption worldwide. So before we get too much further, we'll talk about disclosures. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not investment advice. It's just an informational educational material for you. Please do your own research. I'm also not a programmer or a technical expert, and I do hold digital assets. So as we've mentioned, Bitcoin is the world's first self-building and autonomous network. We've been in a bear market for price now for a, bit, a little bit over a year. But during that time, despite all of the bad press and the bad news and the people withdrawing their funds from the crypto market and so forth, Bitcoin's performance has actually been flawless. It has been technically it's performed flawlessly, not just in this past year, but for 10 years in a row on a protocol level. It hasn't been hacked during that entire time. It hasn't really suffered any downtime at all. And it's consistently churned out these verified and immutable blocks of transactions. I ask, what else on earth has done that? What shows us that kind of consistency? What shows us that kind of error-free performance? I struggle to think of any examples. So that more than the price and the value that humans are seeing in this is really indicative of how well this technology has been developed and written. It's operating flawlessly. One idea I want to introduce you to right away is the S-curve. As we talk about adoption, most things, they follow this sort of S-curve of, of numbers when they become introduced to a market. So the adoption rates on the left-hand scale and time is kind of the one along the bottom. And so you see in the beginning, you have a great uh, number of people who aren't interested at all. There's really no, no performance, no participation here. Once you reach a certain amount of participation, a certain adoption rate, then you suddenly usually see this great um, increase in the slope of the adoption line. And, you know, being people, that's uh, sort of natural. We're glomming onto each other and we're, we're copying each other. So people are piling into a new idea they think is good and might make them a profit or they just want to participate. So the, the gist of it is the line goes up much more steeply after you reach a certain uh, level of participation low down. And then of course at the top you reach sort of a saturation level where the value that's being carried by this network is going to flatten out because everybody who might be interested has sort of gotten interested and so the extra value that's accrued to the network is, is already being recognized in the price. So anyway you see this shape of the S curve and that's what usually happens to adoption of a new technology. Now, make it interesting, we can look at another chart that stretches all the way back to through the 20th century and see somebody has plotted out sort of rough adoption curves for many of the technologies that we use every day, electricity and telephone and TV and cars and cell phones and so forth. The other interesting thing about this chart, uh, along with what we see that it takes some time, these are the decades at the bottom, of course, it takes some time for um, these technologies to penetrate their markets. But the other interesting thing is that we see the ones that are earlier on in the 20th century took a lot longer to reach market penetration, took a lot longer for the telephone to uh, make it into almost all American households. The last latter part of the 20th century, the last 20 years in particular, 25 years, we've seen these adoption curves grow much, much steeper, such that even within a decade or less, we're seeing tremendous increases in adoption. And that's, that's pretty interesting, but it's, of course, it's a function of the computer world and networking um, and connecting us all together. But uh, this is an interesting chart in terms of adoption. Now, somebody drew this little line in at the bottom to show us Bitcoin is here, just raising off the bottom at about 2% after its first couple of years. So um, you can see that we've got a long way to go, which is exciting. I also want to touch on uh, uh, the idea of these Bitcoin price cycles. You can see the price chart here kind of goes up and it's got these instead of a smooth, nice um, S-curve of adoption or 
or lines like this, we see the price is rather jaggedy and it has these peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. And as we study these and we look, we know that these are related behaviorally to what uh, the chart that I showed you early on with the stair stepping down of the Bitcoin distribution. As Bitcoin gets distributed through its network and it rises this curve that it's flattening out already with, we see that the actual number of new Bitcoin steps down about every four years. So what we're seeing in these cycle, this price cycle chart is a little bit of a reflection of human behavior because if you know that the supply is going to be, you know, in the several months it's going to be having what it was, any new Bitcoin coming out of the market, it's going to, that number is going to have, uh, you're possibly going to think, well, that's going to drive the price up and so I want to buy now. And so we get these price uh, spikes um, they can be actually a little bit before the halving and continue for a little while after the halving um, because the market is adjusting to the effect of less flow to the existing stock of Bitcoin. Uh, the miners will only be earning half as much, but in anticipation of that, human behavior says, well, buy it up, buy it up, because there's going to be less new, new supply. And so we see these peaks and valleys along the lifetime of Bitcoin cycle, which is interesting. Another thing that those may represent is uh, the Gartner cycle. And anytime you have sort of a technology trigger, you can see that this interesting curve is sort of drawn and people get super excited in the beginning and it zooms way up to this peak of expectations that may be inflated, um, maybe overinflated, but the excitement zooms up um, behavior and pricing and everything. And then then there's sort of a, a trough of disillusionment after when people are thinking, oh, maybe it's not going to be as great as it seemed at first. And so maybe um, maybe that's not something we want to pursue. But after some time, that trough reaches a bottom and people start to think, well, actually, you know, there was some good in that thing they call the Internet. And maybe we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater and maybe it will survive and everything won't go the way of pets.com. And, and so we start this building process. Uh, as we understand what the true meaning is, re really what can this be used for? And lastly, we reach this sort of plateau where this technology is accepted for the benefits that it can offer. It's not a wild and crazy wild west world where we've got these inflated expectations, but it is also uh, considerably above that trough of disillusionment where people think, well, nothing can be done. So Bitcoin sort of seems like it goes through one of these every time we have one of these halvings because a new group of people sort of get interested and get involved when the price starts to go up and it reaches this sort of inflated expectations and then we have a crash again and everybody says oh it's going to die there's actually a bit a site uh, that calls that's called bitcoin is dead that records every time bitcoin reaches the bottom of this trough of disillusionment and there there are news and headlines that say well it's never going to come back but of course, if it's got some underlying value, if it's got some technology that it's bringing to us, it's going to climb the slope of enlightenment and end up somewhere in the middle until we go through this again several years later. So that's another way to explain some of the uh, peaks and valleys. You can see them here, peak and valley, peak and valley, peak and valley, peak and valley every four years or so. Now, uh, the number of active addresses is still trending up also. And this, because we've got so many metrics available to us with a coin that we can track every single little movement of every coin ever, uh, we've got a lot more metrics that we can look at online. And so the number of active addresses tells us that along with the price spikes, we also have a, a continuing rise. You can see this rise in number of active addresses. So uh, that tells us there are more and more people involved in the protocol. And so we can expect further growth. Layer two is a concept I mentioned before briefly. Layer two is sort of like that bar tab when you go into the bar and you don't actually close out your tab and record it on the base layer or the layer one, which is Visa or MasterCard or your bank card. Um, but you have an informal layer two going with the bartender where he's jotting down, ticking down, a, um, every time you order a drink, he's keeping track of them. Um, and that's totally invisible to the Visa MasterCard that you're ultimately going to pay with, um, yet it's happening locally in the bar and it's very quick and easy to do. That's what a layer two is like. So 
the capacity for layer twos in this crypto world is growing and growing, and particularly with Bitcoin and the Lightning Network, which is a layer two, whereby people can do quick and easy transactions with each other without necessarily recording every single one on the blockchain uh, that chunks along every 10 minutes. And as the usage of that continues, then overall usage of Bitcoin also swells because ultimately those bar tabs are closed out and they are put onto the blockchain. But the Lightning Network capacity surged by 25% just four months, I believe this was last year, but it continues to really, really grow. And a lot of people seem to think that this is going to be uh, the layer two that rides on top of Bitcoin, this informal uh, quick pay version is going to really explode. We do see uh, this year that the um, emerging markets are really leading in the grassroots adoption. Uh, they're seeing the value of being able to have, have accounts of their own that they can manage outside of the authorities. We're seeing the advantages of cross-border transfers being so cheap and easy. Um, so this is really hitting in the parts of the world that don't have those institutions and trust that we have in the United States. So we need to be very aware of this, that we don't get outpaced by the rest of the world. So uh, again, adoption is high in emerging markets. Here's another article from Fortune um, talking about it's dominated by the emerging markets. And again, you know, we, we have insight into these a lot more than we do the traditional markets because of the transparency, because we can see the details of every transaction as I showed you on the printout. Um, that you could anybody you don't need to be a Bitcoin holder or member of anything you can just go on the online and, and find this so Vietnam Philippines Ukraine India uh, the United States is up there because of its size and, and its technological advancements but um, you know Pakistan Brazil Thailand Russia China uh, they're all behind us everybody is sort of piling in and we need to be aware that we need to keep up one of the interesting things that uh, we didn't mention before is that accessibility is just huge. When you go and actually add up the number of hours that our traditional financial markets are open, the, the stock uh, exchange, for example, in New York, um, we find that it's actually closed almost 82% of the time um, because it's only basically you know open business hours and on the weekdays and that's it. Whereas the crypto markets are open 24-7, 365 days a year. So that's 100% availability and accessibility. Whereas our traditional markets, they're closed almost four-fifths of the time. They're closed for business. That's a lot of time. And that really, uh, in our modern world of being connected and communicating, that, that really uh, causes us to suffer loss of, of uh, opportunities to conduct business. Bitcoin is still worth more than America's largest bank. That might surprise somebody. Now, this was from October, a couple of months ago this year. But despite this tremendous price crash that, again, the network itself really doesn't care about, it's about manufacturing these, these verified blocks and it's about recording these transactions. The network is just a tool. As much as the hammer cares what you happen to be hammering on, it does not care about price. And yet, Bitcoin is still worth more than America's largest bank. JP Morgan. So that's cause to have you pause. So we're in this funny place now where in the last chapter I talked about, the last lecture I talked a lot about the resistance to Bitcoin and how it's going to come, especially from the traditional financial markets because they, they do have market share to lose here. They, they have power and control to lose. So the funny thing is at the same time that they are uh, talking it down, they're also, as we know from the other lecture in number eight, that they're also getting themselves invested in it and the business world is exploring every day how can they uh, take advantage of the the uh, blockchain technology so you know are we being manipulated or can both of these be true and this is crazy because uh, you see by these dates this is september and this is november this is mayor a mayor five six weeks later uh, in september jamie diamond called crypto you know, dangerous and a decentralized ponzi scheme that's not good for every anybody so really talking it down like you shouldn't you shouldn't be invested and yet five weeks later um, JP Morgan is executing its first DeFi trade using a public blockchain uh, this is the same company and so you know one has to wonder um, is there a little bit of manipulation going on here too whereby 
um, this decrease in price, this rough year in 2022 is actually allowing for uh, some laggards, uh, even in our business and traditional finance world to, to enter this market because that's what they're doing despite what they're saying. Morgan Stanley also put out a, a thing. This was actually, this is a little bit older, but um, over a year ago, Morgan Stanley uh, said that, you know, th that for a speculative investment to rise to the level of an, an investable asset class, it has to meet certain criteria. More than a year ago, Morgan Stanley said with cryptocurrencies, they think that this threshold is being reached and they suggest investors begin to get educated about this. So at the same time that we're hearing that it's all a Ponzi scheme and it's all going to collapse, we're also hearing from these same players that it's now an investable asset class and they want to offer it to their high net worth individuals. Another measure that we can measure, remember we talked about how the hash rate um, is uh, the amount of computing power that's brought to try to solve those puzzles so that the miners can win. The more hash rate you can bring to the table, the better opportunity you have of being able to be, able to be the validating node, attaching the next block of transactions and earning yourself some Bitcoin. So the higher the hash rate gets, the more and more difficult the network gets to attack. And so the more secure everything is on it. And even though we've seen these price uh, the, the dark line here in the background is the price going up and then coming down again in this bear market. We see the hash rate in blue continuing to rise, rise, rise. This big drop was when China outlawed it and everybody said, oh, that's it for Bitcoin. China has outlawed the mining and look at how it recovered so quickly and then it continues to rise even as the price drops. That's another signal to us, another uh, metric we can use to see that this network continues to grow in adoption and adoption worldwide despite any attempts of the major players in the banking system, major governments and so forth. So the future is very positive for this. Um, and just to kind of wrap up with this, uh, this lecture, despite the volatility that we've seen through its history, which now we know from Gartner cycles and adoption S curves, there's going to be volatility in, a, in an emergent technology. Sometimes um, this network and the underpinning structures continue to grow. There continue to be more addresses. The hash rate continues to grow and adoption continues to be taken up by permissionless players all around the world. Ultimately, the combination of a limited supply, incredible divisibility, and just its pure flat out usefulness, its cheapness and its speed they are all combining to be predictive of continued growth. So the future still seems very bright from Bitcoin, despite volatility, despite ups and downs, despite um, the fear and the uncertainty and then doubt sowed by players who um, perhaps feel threatened by this technology that is not directly threatening anybody, but does continue to grow because of its usefulness and will ultimately displace some of these players, which leads to the fear that you're seeing and hearing about. So that wraps up the 10 uh, lessons. Uh, again, if you've got questions, I would love to communicate with you. Um, please go ahead and contact me. You can see my website down below. Happy to continue the conversation and answer any questions you may have.